that if we can make one, we can make many. And so what you see here is a circuit that we fabricated in PDMS, which is the squishy material that is in bouncy rubber balls. And this circuit is very simple. It has two different uh, sizes of channels. The blue channels shown here are very narrow and very thin, very shallow. And the annular red channel here, the donut-shaped channel, is very deep and very wide. And the idea here is that by, uh, by taking these fluidic resistance into account, we can put in our aqueous material, our reaction input into the center. We can bring our oil in on the left-hand side, and the oil will sweep around at the outside of the circuit, sweeping the aqueous fluid as it is pumping out of these nozzles over to the droplet output and collect emulsions. This was the idea for how this should work. And to give you an idea of scale, that's a dime. But that's actually the dime next to the circuit in real size. So this is a very, very small piece of real estate that this circuit occupies. So this is the circuit in action. And it is literally what you saw on the last slide times 100. And in our lab, we've made circuits times 300, times 1,000. And this is really a scalable approach and actually may get us to the point where we can look at liters of fluid. So here are a couple, of more, a couple more pictures of the circuit in action. And all you're seeing here is an aqueous solution that's been stained purple so that we can see it. And the oil flow coming around the outside in the annular channel, sweeping off these, these droplets as they're, as they're budding from the, from the aqueous channels uh, off to be collected. All right, so, but we're not just interested in making purple droplets, we're actually interested in doing chemistry. But making the purple droplets was really fun in La Jolla, and everyone would <laughs> stop to look at them. So the experiment on our new microfluidic islands is this. We actually start with our islands, and we populate each one with a highly diverse library of our ligase ribozyme that I told you about previously. And here the idea again is that we're trying to keep people from competing. We're trying to look at the diverse structure of sequence space. But again, we needed a, we needed a challenge. We, needed these, we don't want these molecules to be on Hawaii where it's wonderful paradise. We actually want to give them a challenge. And the challenge here was this molecule called, which neomycin, but is the kryptonite of this particular molecule. So neomycin is a class of molecules uh, it belongs to a class of molecules called aminoglycosides, which bind to RNA molecules and, uh, and in, in, as, as antimicrobials inhibit a variety of RNA-catalyzed reactions, including the reaction that puts together amino acids into proteins. It's a very potent antimicrobial agent. And we were looking for molecules that would be resistant to this antibiotic. And to give you an idea for what this antibiotic does, we actually measured growth of our parent molecule. This is the molecule, a Superman molecule, that came out of the chip that I just described, which had gone through 500 logs of selective growth. And no neomycin, our, our molecule is a champ and grows wonderfully over two hours. But with 100 micromolar neomycin, it's totally flatlined. It is completely incompetent at, at, at amplifying in the presence of this antibiotic. However, in our experiment, we hypothesized that each of these droplets, now populated by an individual, all different mutants, some might actually be able to resist this aminoglycoside, throw it off, amplify, and we would be able to look at all of, the, all of the winners, all of the molecules who could survive in this new challenging environment. So from this compartmentalized evolution experiment, we did, in fact, isolate three different families, very diverse groups of molecules, that were able to resist this aminoglycoside assault. And one in particular, I've just labeled them class one, two, and three here, but uh, they're all between five and nine error mutants away from the parent molecule. And one individual stuck out for, for us for a variety of uh, more esoteric reasons because it had made structural changes that we hadn't really seen before in this particular ligase. And so we singled it out in study, mostly because when we removed the neomycin from the reaction, it actually was no longer capable of amplifying. This molecule had become dependent on the aminoglycoside for amplification. And this is interesting from the standpoint of this particular molecule, which this, this particular phenotype had never been observed before. But it's also interesting from this paper from this little journal called Nature from 1962, in which um, one of the first studies of bacteria that had evolved resistance to aminoglycosides had also evolved dependence. 
And the really interesting thing, actually, is that these bacteria not only were dependent on their aminoglycoside, but they could actually grow on some other aminoglycosides, but yet not others. And some recent data from Jerry's lab, when I just flew back for some data wrapping up this paper, we also, also found that our molecule was capable of growing on a variety of different aminoglycosides. The takeaway the take from this story, though, is that on the right is biology. These are cells. These are or very complex organisms. On the left is a molecule that was plucked out of random sequence space. It is a purely random, it is a man-made molecule. But its physical chemical properties are identical to the molecules that are inside of these bacteria that cause this dependence phenotype to arise. And this is something that we look for in the Joyce lab, where ways in which simple chemical systems begin to exhibit biological behavior. All right, so I would like to uh, end my talk with a quote from a very famous bongo player who also studied quantum mechanics at Caltech. This is Richard Feynman, and uh, this quote actually has really inspired me moving forward, which is that I, I, what I cannot create, I do not understand. You've seen here that in microfluidics, we've been able to have this kind of exquisite control over how we present reagents to one another. And this uh, kind of echoes two prizes, that two challenges that Feynman issued in his 1959 lecture. Uh, one challenge was to build a electronic motor in the space uh, occupied by 1 64th of an inch on a side. And the other was to print the first page of the Encyclopedia Britannica on a page that was 1 25,000th the size. And it turned out that it only took a year to get the electronic motor, but it actually took um, until 1985, so 25 years, and this little school over on the other side of the bay to come up with an electron beam writer that would write the, uh, Charles Dickens' um, Tale of Two Cities on the head, head of a pin. The idea here, though, is that in these kind of stunts, these, uh, these exercises and seeing how much control can we get over the system, this is how revolutions happen. This was Feynman's vision. And part of this vision was that it's only until we achieve this kind of control over chemistry and biology that we will really have insight into how these systems actually work when they stop being black boxes and they start being a tool that we use every day and understand at the very most molecular level. And so this is where I stand in my group here, where we are trying to, we are trying to tackle this problem of how do you build this compartment on the outside? And it starts from the droplets that you just saw previously. Because the droplets that you saw that were running these RNA evolution experiments are merely nothing more than water bags in oil, and they are solvated by a single layer of surfactant molecules. And this is what stabilizes these droplets and prevents them from coalescing into one another. This structure, though, is reminiscent of a cell membrane, but we just need to get the outer leaflet of this membrane to get a vesicle. And there's one key difference, too, between these systems, which is that the droplets that I showed you are a two-phase system. They are aqueous sitting in a sea of oil, whereas vesicles are a one-phase system. They have water on the inside and water on the outside, exactly how biology operates. And why are we interested? This is, a, this is yet another landscape and a very important landscape for evolution because this is where interesting phenotypes like transmembrane pores and receptors, this is where these molecules were born. And maybe they started from vesicles uh, composed of oleic acid, but today they live in vesicles of phosphatidylcholine and so forth. But the problem is, and this is the, one of the main problems that Jack was talking about in his talk, is that making these vesicles is, is more of an art than a science. And what we'd like to tackle is, we would like to tackle this problem and treat this like an actual synthetic target, like my colleagues in Building A. So this is not just, so the way that we do this right now is we take lipids, and we dry them into a round bottom flask with some heat and make a film, and you put on the material that you want to put inside the vesicle, and you swirl three times counterclockwise, and you wait for a couple of hours, and then you get this mess up here. And it's not, and it is a vesicular mess. You have vesicles inside of vesicles inside of vesicles next to other ones inside of a bigger vesicle. This is a disaster if you want to do science. But it turns out that there is a way to control this, but it needs some help. <laughs> 